Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence, understanding that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't live it, you can't learn it. And carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. You take care of it by 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's the work of Christ from the cross to the Christian life. He confesses it, and he restores him to spirituality. Why that's important is John 14, 26, the, the Holy Spirit that lives in us will teach and recall the word of God to our souls in ministry form, either to us or through us. And so, our Father, we come to you today, and we thank you for these, Father, that have come out to study the Word of God, understanding the importance of categorical thinking and the study of the Word of God, because the Holy Spirit ministers through the Word of God, not only to us, but through us, and that's an enormous, wonderful blessing to our life. I lift Karen Bell before you today, Father, and what a wonderful, it just lifted my soul so wonderful to see the Word of God just ooze from her and discussions of the way God works in her life in regard to her mother and her. It's so refreshing to see that. We spend so much time with whine, whiny babies that shouldn't have to be whining all the time. They have the maturity of the information of gnosis in their life, but they never transfer it to epinosis. They don't have that assurance that God is with them, that he will never leave them. Even though they've got the scripture, they don't have the dynamics of it in their life by application. I pray for that today, Father, especially upon Karen Bell and her mother, as well as other in our church, but especially on them today as they just touched my soul in a marvelous way. It's whatever pastor loves to see uh, in, in either his people or other people who have caught on the message of grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, the way I love, the thing I love about 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is not so much the book, even though I do love it. I think they are marvelous books. Uh, if you operate in the church, these are two books you quote from all the time, other than Romans. Uh, but when you get to the operation, th these books start right out, and they're phenomenal. Well, what I love about them is how, they, how the church came into being. What, what really interests me is how the church at Corinth came in. We study their problems, but we don't really see the phenomenal aspect of how they came into existence, how the mission field, how Paul wasn't even looking for that mission field when God said, this is the mission field I want you to go for. He wasn't even looking for it. In fact, he was looking to go a different direction when he was in Asia, when he was in Asia, you can read about this in Paul's second missionary trip. It's a marvelous thing, but the Corinth comes out of that. And, and we'll talk about some of that. But what's interesting to me is the people behind the book and the story of the people behind the book, how this church came into existence by Paul's obedience to the vision at Troas. And how that church came into existence. And now how important these people are. Converted through the gospel of Christ. They planted the flag in Corinth. And Corinth has now become one of the major mission churches to go westward in the Roman Empire. It's just a marvelous story behind these people. Sometimes we meet the people of the church and don't, don't know anything about the history of the people of the church. And so I, this is what I love about 2 Corinthians, the second chapter especially. When, when I get into 2 Corinthians and I, I look at the theology now of Paul writing back to the people, he tells you he, he's got a history with these people. He founded them. He was the evangelist that went in and as a missionary. And God, God, there was no doubt in Paul's mind 
when he went to Macedonia, there was no doubt because God had given him a vision. It's called the call of Macedonia on the second missionary trip. And Paul writes back to him in the second book of Corinthians in verse 12, and he makes mention of this. When Paul had the call to Macedonia in Acts 16, 8 through 10, when he had this call, he was headed north. And he paused, and he put this before the Lord in prayer, and, prayer, and then God said, don't go north. No, no, no. I want you to go westward. And this became an important call in his life to carry the gospel westward in the Roman Empire. It changed his life, and it changed his discipline by God. Big time. Because good. God told him through the call of Macedonia to go westward. God didn't want him to go any other direction but westward with the gospel and the evangelism and mission work. And so Troas, and so in verse 12, now when I came to Troas, he, does, he speaks in remembrance. When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me and the Lord, Listen, I can't begin to tell you how important two things are linked here. First, the gospel and the willingness to carry it forward. Be willing to take the gospel someplace that God tells you to go. Watch that now. And the open door. You always pay two attention, gospel and open door. Gospel and open door. The gospel and the word of God and an open door. The gospel and the word of God and the open door. These things go together. And so he reminds them, now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me and the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Listen, when God opened that door, when he was in Troas in Asia, and God opened that door to Macedonia, his spirit could find no rest until he went. That's a call, Bubba. That's a call. And I can't tell you how important that is to my, my life right now. I can't begin to tell you how important that is to my life. You have got to come to understand that. He says, my spirit could find no rest. But thanks be to God, verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ through what? An open door for the word of God and the gospel. Because, listen, your custodians of the word of God and evangelism. The church of Jesus Christ is responsible for two things. And what's important where, where these move is open doors. Open doors is the key. Now, sometimes we get so settled in America that we don't understand we're a mission church in movement. We're a mission in movement. And sometimes we forget that. Billy, I promise you, never forgets that. Never. And if he ever does, the father will shut him down. He'll shut him down in a heartbeat. Because you, you keep going where he puts you. Listen, the person that runs the church is Jesus Christ. I don't run it. Billy don't run it. But he does. And so what we, what we have in this subject matter here in verse 14, God does the calling. God opens the doors. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. 
See, it's every place, not just some place. It's every place. Where he opens the door, you go. Verse 15, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God. Watch this now. Watch the word among. He uses it twice, point one, point two. Watch this now. For we are his aroma among, watch this now. This is, the, this is what the open door does. Among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. That's where the open door takes you. It takes you to, pe some people are being saved and the rest of them are perishing. And that's why he sends you. And you know what the answer is? The gospel. And then the word of God for growth. And to the one, an aroma from death to death, the perishing. And to the other, an aroma from life to life, those being saved. Now watch. He asks us all the question. Here's your question for you today. Not from me, but from God. Who is adequate for these things? You know where, you know where, you know where the answer lies? It lies in verse 12 and 13. Who is able to go when God opens the door? Who's able to go? Who is adequate? Who is sufficient? Who, is, who has been properly prepared to do that? Who is adequate for these things? And then verse 70, we, we are not those who go around peddling the word of God for money, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. We don't go, we don't go do these things for a paycheck or for popularity or to make my name greater. It's not why you do it. It's all about Christ. It's to make his name more. Than, it's to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere he opens the door. He opens the door everywhere. And when he opens the door, you got to go. Why? Because he puts an unrest in your spirit. Right, Billy? Got to go. Now, here it is. Here it is. Last Sunday, last Sunday, I talked about six things about our 20, five things about our 2020 vision for this church. I'm going to give you some more. Last Sunday, I shared five points in the 2020 vision for spreading the fragrance of Christ in Sinclair County. This Sunday, I'm going to share six additional points of the 2020 vision. What, what are our intentions? Number one, we will take custodianship of the word of God and evangelism, the teaching of categorical teaching throughout Sinclair County. Number two, we will schedule Gary Horton in all the high schools and middle schools of Sinclair County to present the gospel. We will offer ministry to growing families on the church field of Argo, Springville, Margaret, Odaville, Moody, Leeds, and Trustful if they're open. We will be open to home Bible studies in Pale City, Asheville, and Raglan. We will raise $100,000 by January to purchase, plan, to purchase land to build a church. When I left the church last Sunday, I had $60,000 in the bank. So if you think it's going to be an issue of money, I keep, I've told you for 45 years of my ministry, it's never about money. It's about faith. It's never about money. I don't know why. I don't know why you don't understand that. But in case you didn't understand it, he made it pretty clear. Before I walked out of this church last Sunday, a person came to me and gave me $60,000 for the land. And I know that God is up to this. Now I'm asking you to put, let God put in your heart the other $40,000. we are going to go buy a piece of land. We're going to build a church, and we're going to be out there. We're going to be there. And I want to be there after January. I want to be out there by January. And we're out right now 
we are out currently negotiating space to rent for one year while constructing a functional building. My spirit will have no rest until we're moving. It will have no rest. And we have voted to do that. It's not up for debate. We have voted to sell this church, and it's in the process. We have looked at buildings, and we can't find one. So we're going to build one. So we're looking for property. We're looking at 5 to 10 acres, something like that. This is not up for discussion anymore. It's just about a matter of packing up and going. The door has been opened. The door has been opened. Point number two, our 2020 ministry vision came from Paul's vision to go Macedonia. You say, Ron, where do you get this idea? I got it from Paul. I got it from Paul. I got it from Paul out of Acts 16, 8 through 10, when he had a vision in Troas, a call to go to Macedonia. You say, well, are you telling me, Ron, you had a vision and a call to Macedonia? No, but I'll tell you what I had. I had a call to go to Moody. A year ago, I sat down in the School of Biblical Theology and looked across the table. I asked people where they were from. I had seven or eight guys in the room. Five of them were from Moody. I had five young ministers from Moody. who called me to come to Moody, believe it or not. When are you going to come to Moody? You say, well, that's not a lot. Five ministers is a lot. Young ministers that need the word of God taught, need to be loved on, need to be nurtured and mentored, all out in Moody. One of those has already graduated from the school, and the others are in the way of the School of Biblical Theology. Now, I know a lot of times you don't know all that stuff because, you know, you got your own things going on in your life. So sometimes I have to stop and tell you these things. A year ago, when I suggested we should do this, I gave you Revelation 3.8. I gave you Revelation 3.8 because I knew 2 Corinthians 2.12. That God opens and closes doors. To the church at Philadelphia, he told them, God opens doors that no man can shut. Nobody. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe... I believe my call is not to Macedonia. My call is to Moody. And we put it before you. Forty families said, we'll go. And seven families said no. I hope the seven families will change your mind if you're, not, if you're not physically unable to do that. So, a door has been opened for me and the Lord. And I believe this church, we are more than prepared to go out there as a solid, mature church and spread what we have set upon for a long time spread it throughout Sinclair County and beyond. Paul gave me two doctrinal principles that I share with you today. Number one, when he opens the door, he doesn't close it. Therefore, what's he going to do? God always leads us in triumph in Christ. You can take that to the bank. He will lead us in triumph in Christ. Just as he did here 45 years ago. Number two, it's the word manifest. God manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge everywhere. 
listen, I'm not just content with Sinclair County. I'm after it. I'm going to get it. But I'm after the state of Alabama, the southeast, the America, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But I'm going by Acts 1.8. You start in Jerusalem, you go to Judea, you go to Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. This word knowledge, this word knowledge, the knowledge of Christ everywhere is gnosis. You know what gnosis is? You know the, listen, you know the, the faith cycle where you have hearing, believing. On one side, you have applying and completing on the other side. Listen to me. Gnosis goes on the hearing, believing side, and epinosis goes on the applying and completing side. See, there are people out there that need, to, need the knowledge of Christ, gnosis, and don't have it. And we're loaded up with epinosis, and that's why we're sent to those who are interested in the knowledge of God. they got to have somebody that fully understands it to stand up and teach it to them, or sit down and teach it to them, or have a cup of coffee and share it with them. Let me tell you, there are a lot of hungry people for the Word of God out in that moody area, what I call the moody area. And what I call my church field runs all the way from Springville all the way to 280. Those are the people I'm after. What people want is knowledge. People everywhere want it. Billy, people over there, are they hungry for knowledge? Yeah, and it takes somebody with epi notes. It don't take you long on a mission field to start a school of training pastors to give them epinosis. Agreed? The first thing you know when you sit down with people who are hungry for gnosis and you've got epinosis is to take them to epinosis so they can do what you're doing. Here's my third point. As a mature doctrinal church of 45 years, Doctrinal Studies Bible Church has become a responsible church as custodian of the Word of God and the gospel of great salvation in Alabama, neighboring states, and the world. What many of you don't know because you haven't been with us for five years. Many of you do not know that we have been involved in establishing doctrinal churches throughout the state of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida over the years. We have planted churches all over. At one time, there were four in Alabama, four in Mississippi. We had three in Florida, and we had four in Georgia. You know why we started the School of Biblical Theology? Because we couldn't find qualified men to hold them. So we started up our own seminary program so we could train guys when churches were planted. We stopped planting them because we couldn't, we couldn't find pastors worth their salt to fill them. You'd send a pastor out there, and the first thing you know, he blew the church wide open. Or else he got a better deal. They wouldn't go out, and they couldn't cut the, couldn't cut the mustard, as my people used to say. And so we lost a lot of those churches that once were up and going. And so we started a school of biblical to train our own guys to go out there and teach, to do it the right way and trust God. You should not be able to be bought off a mission field. You should not be able to be bought off. Jesus, listen, the devil tried to buy Jesus off his mission field, right? Matthew, the fourth chapter, tried to buy him. Listen, you got to put a for sale sign up on your forehead. I'm not for sale. That's what I've done the last 45 years. You think possibly I've not had offers to go to other places? God didn't open no doors for me. This was my door. I need to move that door down the road. You need to understand, this church has been a dynamic church. 
We just need to move it to another location where that dynamics, where people are hungry for that dynamics, where you can actually tell your kids when they graduate from college, come and move here. When we started this church, we invited everybody. I taught all over in college campuses, and we invited all those kids. And listen, Mary and Price and guys like that and the duels and people like that, they came out of their college. They moved to Birmingham. They moved to us. We can't do that. Pray. You know that you can't do that. Got to be somewhere where we can actually tell people they can move. And, and that's progressive, that's growing. They're building five, 600 homes out there. Every year I'm out there, they're building homes everywhere. That's the people I want. I'm not looking to go out to Moody and proselyte. People should stay in their churches and be happy. I'm not looking for church people. I'm looking for unbelievers. I'm looking for people who are moving that don't have churches, that want to be taught the word of God, that are not going to drive to Roebuck. They're not going to do it. No more than you want to drive to them. They don't want to drive to you. They want to be in their home community. They want this to happen to their families, their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles. That's what I believe. I believe that with all my heart. We are moving our base of ministry operation to a neighboring community, not out of state. Our lesson text is from the second letter written to one of the churches planted by Paul from his vision to go to Macedonia. You have no idea. You have no idea. Chuck Farmer put this in my soul many years ago. Unfortunately, he's not going to live. He didn't live long enough to see this thing come to fruit. But, buddy, I'm telling you, this is the answer to Chuck, Chuck Farmer's prayer. When he moved to Leeds, he was not going to be content until we got out there. And listen, we, st we started looking way back then. But I can tell you right now, that area is hot. Our ministry of spreading the fragrance of the grace gospel of Christ is directed towards two groups. Notice the two groups among those who are being saved and those who are perishing who need to be saved. Be sure somewhere during the week you write down these two groups on that piece of paper, for that's why we're going. We are going for those who need to be saved and those who don't know they need to be saved but need to hear it. The one thing that separated these two people is one got saved. Listen, when Paul walked in to Macedonia, they, they were both one person. They were both perishing. When Paul preached the gospel, he divided the perishing. The one group of the perishing got saved and the rest of them didn't. You understand that, don't you? That's how you become believers. That's how a church comes into existence. That's exactly how it happens. The one thing they both had in common, they started out both perishing. The gospel separated them. The gospel, the grace gospel separated these two groups into believers and unbelievers. The ones who were never perishing and the ones who were always perishing without Christ. Billy hit that very well this morning. Listen to this one. I'm about to close. To the one in aroma from death to death. You know who those are? The perishing. And aroma. It didn't say a good one. You know what? You know what? You know what? John 11, John 11, uh, 39. You know what? Death to death has a stench. The Bible called it a stench. You remember Lazarus? They said after four days, his body will rot. And he'll stink. Called a stench. Death to death. They don't have a chance. It's the smell of death. Have you ever smelled death? I have. Almost any military man that served on battlefield knows the stench of death. <clears throat> it 
in some nursing homes, you can smell it when you go in. But there is an aroma to the nostrils of God for those who are dead. They are spiritually dead in time, and if they die without faith in the gospel of Christ, they will go to the second death. The second death, that's apart from God forever. Revelation, the 20th chapter, well worth your read if you're not familiar with that. That's going from death to death, spiritual death in time to spiritual death in eternity. Why do you carry the gospel, Billy? Why do you carry the gospel, Billy? Why do you carry the gospel, Ernie? Why do you carry the gospel? To, listen, you can, you, can, you can correct death to death immediately. They go, the moment they believe the gospel that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, they're going to go from life to life, not death to death. They're going from life to life. He told Martha the very thing in John 11, 25, 26. He said, once, once their faith is in me, they will never die. Do you believe that, Martha? Well, she said, I know there's a resurrection thing coming along. Oh, no, no, listen. It's now, Martha. It's now. I am the resurrection and the life, Martha. It's not down the way. It's not down, oh, yes, I know, out in the future. No, 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 Martha, Martha, Martha. It is now. Paul, when he wrote to the 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, he said, today is the day of salvation. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to get saved. It's a volitional choice you make. Do you want to be saved? Listen, if you're not, you're dead and you're going to die. When you physically die and you are not saved, you're going to go to the lake of fire in the end. That would sadden me so bad. Because right now where you sat, you can believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. You got to believe it, though, son. You got to believe it. Not hear it. You got to believe it. Not hear it. You got to transfer that for, listen, you got to transfer that information 18 inches. You got to believe it. Now, I know the heart and the head is not the same as my body. I'm just using an illustration. I haven't lost my theology. Death to death. How is the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ? How does it divide people? It divides families. It divided mine, did it not divide yours? When you got saved and, and you're, you said, listen, like Billy said, I'm positionally righteous. I'm going to live the righteous life the best I know how. There was a desire in my heart to do that. I lost friends. I lost family members. They thought I was kooky. Then I... I, I went into the, quote, ministry. I mean, how nutty is that? Took a small church. How nutty is that? How you doing, Ron? How nutty is that? What kind of money you make, Ron? How nutty is that? <laughs> That's how some people keep score, you know, in the family. So some people can score. How you doing, Ron? How you doing? I don't know. I'll let you know at the end of the year. How you doing? I'm being led. Here's what I tell my family. I'm being led in triumph in Christ everywhere I go. I'm being led in triumph. You know why? Because I choose to follow him. I choose to follow him. This is not the first time I've done this. I choose to follow him. So the question is answered by you today, who is adequate for these things? Are you up to it? You just want to sit in your rocking chair until you die because that's all you think about is dying? Don't do that. What a futile life that is. Sit in a rocking chair till you die. Be a Caleb. Look for a mountain to climb. Where's your service for Christ? Are you adequate for these things? 
Of course you are. You're breathing, aren't you? Even if you're bar barely. If, it, if you're barely breathing, you're adequate for these things. You've sat under Bible doctrine for all these years. It's time to share it with other people who haven't heard it once. You ought to study at the very bottom of that page. You ought to study this little word, adequate. I put it there for you to study and make a good weekly study for you. Adequate. Are you adequate? Are you adequate? He wrote to a mature church in 2 Corinthians. He wrote to a mature church and asked him, are you adequate for these things? What things were he talking about? Everything listed from 12 to 17 is what he's talking about. Let me close with Karen Bell because I opened with her. God bless her. She gave one of the most wonderful reports and testimonies regarding the health of her mother I've heard in a long time. It was a message from a soul of great hope in God, a spiritual mature lady spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ among the saved. When I got reading that, my heart was so enlightened and on fire because she keeps her head above the water, not sitting in a rocking chair, going to sleep and letting life pass by. God bless Karen Bell. Pray for her every day. She's having a great ministry, by the way. She's having a great ministry like the rest of us. It's just encouraging to hear it. Like Billy. Thank you, Billy. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. I don't know any other way to challenge the people, Father. I love them. This is one of the most wonderful godly, grace-oriented, mature churches that need to share this information with a community who is desperate for it. You've opened a door that no man can shut, but every other man has to walk through. May we be that people. May we not say, well, if that's the way Ron feels, Ron ought to do it. Ron is going to do it. That's not the point. As a, mature per, as a mature church, we should do it. We should carry this fragrant aroma to every place that God would give us. It needs to go to everywhere. This is a wonderful idea of a church field. Buy that piece of land for us, Father. Give us the heart to build it. But greater than that, Father, give us the ministry that will flow from the body of this group to a group of people that are hungry for the knowledge of Christ. They're hungry for the knowledge of Christ. And we need to go with them. I pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen.